Okay, um, I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to the Poetry Box Live. So let's go ahead and get started with our very first featured reader. Mary Flo Florio is the author of The Fog. Mary has been writing poetry for over 20 years. Early successes include second place in the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Competition. And in 2017, she was featured in Nasty Women Poets, an unapologetic anthology of subversive verse. She has collaborated on two books with award-winning book artist, Miriam Scher, Cinderella Ever After, and The Posture Queen. And most recently was a finalist in the 2019 Palm Beach Poetry Festival's Ekphrastic Poetry Contest. So please welcome Mary Florio. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and um, quite an honor. And I want to thank Sean and I want to thank also um, um, Meg and Cynthia. Um, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to be reading. Um, the, the name of um, my, my book is The Fog, which seems, uh, I guess, um, self-evident. Um, you know, this idea of confusion. Um, but for me, um, during this past year, there was this, this sense of um, a heightened awareness of the um, isolation, uh, the isolation of suffering and um, what, that, what that brought um, to my understanding of the brutality of suffering. And so what I did uh, for the reading tonight is I chose um, animal poems um, because to me, there's something really um, um, special about the suffering of animals um, and, and in the way that they um, don't express that suffering. Um, and so um, I'll start with um, the first one, which is called The Animal in the Poem. The Animal in the Poem. It's only sad because there's an animal inside it. It's like with anything, the meat of a walnut or the meat of a wild hare a journey through diffidence to a different side of the self. The memory is the sighing part. I tell myself I didn't want to kill, and yet I killed. Sometimes there were horns and sometimes only wings. I had a job where I watched as children sat in rows and watched me. I read them stories about bears and deer, the father lore. A boar once on a bone stick. Stories curated as modern mystery, cautery and fire, augury. I taught them all the fancy ways to kill. I called this love my ears blossoming with fur. Saint Rock, um, that's spelled R-O-C-H. He was a very famous saint. 700 years ago, a bubo swollen man wielding a cross shaped birthmark wandered into a forest where a kind dog found him and licked his wounds. Here be dragons and the loathsome chimera. I was thinking of that saint when I read about the pilgrims who swallowed the air before riding the plague bus into Tampa, like the ancient Abyssinians who wrapped themselves in the winding claws of the dead in order to please God exponentially. The gun I'm holstering at the moment is both cloth and mask a bandit scarf bolded into a sad story, my beak lined with mint and vinegar, my coat waxed with myrrh. 
because I need milk and cheese and new wine and the hands of others handing me these things, the clouds bright and holy as I travel into dusk, every bright thing haloed and crowned. Alexa, what would we do without our Alexa, right? <laughs> our sometimes best friend. Oh my gosh, Alexa just, Alexa stop. <laughs> Alexa stop, I'm sorry. Alexa, the nicest friendliest animal in the world is the dolphin, she says. She doesn't know if she's always been a girl. <gasps> Alexa, stop. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the nicest, friendliest animal in the world is the dolphin, she says. She doesn't know if she's always been a girl, but her spirit animal is the wolf. And when the wolf dines, so dines everyone. One of her favorites is a seahorse overhunted and endangered. Another is the red panda, which is not a real panda. Because of 8.7 million species, because of 20 quintillion animals. I'm not an animal, she tells me. A mineral at best, that she is always so kind. The best dog is the one you love, she says, uncircling. It's me, God, the Wolverine. Hereby I'm a petition as to why I should be spared extinction. It has been said that I possess true wilderness. I am more than the giant weasel others say I am. I am more than my fur. I possess an odd tooth for pulping bone. In certain myths, it is I who created the world. I present to you X-Man and the adamantium sprawl. There's my mating, which begins and halts and then begins again in the secret caves of my beloved. There's the way I smell, the tattered musk. If left overnight in someone's house, a house filled with precious antiquities say, I could clamor a more definitive chaos. I am my own state and my state flower is the claw. I remember all the old terrors. And then I think of this as the Wolverine sort of mantra. It's called me. <clears throat> I think that if God should make a plan to let someone live just for being good, it should be me. No one says my name the way I do. And what is true for me is truer than it is for you. I feel this in my bones. I don't know how to be any better than I am. I don't think that this should be a sin worth dying for. This is called what next? That's always the question, right? Like whatever's next, like what? <laughs> There's always something worse, right? What next? <clears throat> You're waiting at the train station in Hapro, Pennsylvania, where 100 years ago they made hats out of beaver pelts. Think mercury and madness, mad as a hatter. Abandoned dams and traps hidden just beneath the icy surfaces of icy streams. A gnawed paw caught in the current, a branch rustling into runes. You're on your way to a Dylan concert where he'll be booed for playing an electric guitar. You teach at a junior high called Unami, a school named for a tribe of the Lenny Lenape. By the time William Penn arrived in 1682, they'd been decimated by an epidemic into what he later called remnants. You're imagining an engine that huffs a dragony cloud cuckoo land, one that jumps the rails and converges calamitously with your life, 
while the snow feathers over a scene where nothing is as it ever was, where you're just gone. But no, silliness, the train is still chuffing and your friend has you by the arm now and is steering you up the ponderous steps into the grim monster's heart, the glass windows black as coal, Dylan still on the horizon, the beavers still dying, you still alive. Years later, you'll marry and suffer such suffering that each night you'll pray for a train. And it won't be until years later that you'll finally be able to chew off your own dampened foot. You'll marry again and go mad again. No sui generis here, just another bite into the familiar peach, the sweet trap of cyanide hidden in the pit, more plague than anyone could imagine. Many years later, you'll find yourself living next to a train station where late at night your apartment will shimmy into silence after the cars clatter past on their way to Orlando. Another point south, the soul of you still on its impossible journey to someplace else. There's a virus this time too, unswerving, unrepentant, the engine of it huffing the air into origami clouds of particulate matter so articulate there can be no denying the kind of song it's layering and then laying down. Lyrics electric with harpsichords and Baroque battalions of bruise and crown, the restless slather and hum of more and more of the dying. This is my body. Yesterday in the bookstore, I asked where the poetry was. I'll take you there, said the man, and I followed his plaid tie and lay beside the stacks and drank my fill of love, taken as he had promised. My cat sat at home on his rug, neither eating nor drinking. He has decided to die, his ruff already fluffing into holy spurge, like, like Isaiah, he has become acquainted with infirmity. I tell him that in Israel, he will live in safety, the holly and the ivy, his naming vines. He is transcending, so I bend to his needs. I remind him of his name, brush his paws with water, beg him to drink. Penguins. The penguins swimming inside their sea world rookery seemed rubbery and fit. Each yearling rocketed skyward and then down, Sisyphean and haunted. In another room, the elders huddled on an ice floe and shivered as we watched them, deciding social distance and then ignoring it, gathering warmth in the tiny buckets tucked beneath their pinions. My grandson was trying to greet them through the glass. Beyond the pale blue moon of their tiny sun, my grandson was trying to teach them about gratitude, but they remained beyond the pale, swimming mercilessly just beyond reach, always beyond the limit of his desire. They wanted only each other again and again. Thanksgiving. Um, I was addicted to this um, Netflix show called Chef's Table for a while. So this is the next to the last poem. <clears throat> and this is about the chef uh, Magnus Nielsen. When the man sits cross-legged and builds a fire of juniper branches to make tea um, the pines seem careful not to intrude on the little waves that lick him. Somewhere a dairy cow waits patiently to be folded into her tattered stall. She is a living monster of meat, according to the man who loves her and will later cook her, silently sizzling her into his mercy. That night there will be blood bread, lichen porridge and an egg cured in ash. 
honeysuckle cured and pickled in brine. The junipers will firefly and then break over a stove set like a plow in the center of the room. I'm thankful not yet to be the meat, the meal. Later, perhaps to be a small and holy harvest of speckled mushrooms and fennel, root cellar loined in stone for the keeping hours. And the last, which I hope um, lifts us into love, <laughs> wheelbarrow. It's blue flat sky and matte, a private hue virgins might choose to wear against the skin before unlocking assonance by chance and pledging tithe to what lips do or time, the cusp, the bite, the consequential must, the heat, the bleat of no one's blood but theirs. Each day reminds them the way the father's cornered sheep splayed the ragged coats and wore the blood. One bears what one must bear between lines lavendered and set to random rhyme. My wheelbarrow is red, not blue. Steel wheel, con Catherine constant as a turtle dove reeling in a village square for love that keening can't define or true. You get my meaning? Love is the color that outstays itself, gleaning, grieving. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mary. That was absolutely lovely. And I'm so glad that you read the penguin poem because that's one of my favorites in the whole book. I love penguins. Thank so. you so much. <laughs> and uh, oh, and I'm, I just had to crack up with the whole, you know, interruption of our friend, our digital assistant friend. I won't say her name. Uh, <laughs> Don't say it. <laughs> my a funny, funny thing, my, uh, my son's wife has the same name. And they had to kind of reprogram all their digital, uh, <laughs> in their smart home, so that that wouldn't be every time he said her name, it wouldn't trip it up. <laughs> so it's it's kind of an interesting uh, scenario with that. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah. All right, thank you for understanding. Yeah. Oh, you bet. It's all good. All good. So much. Alexa, stop. <laughs>